The year is 334 BC, and I am Aristes, satrap of the region Hellespontine Fiergia, which is situated in western Anatolia. The word has been received from both locals and imperial messengers alike that Alexander of Macedon has transported an army in the southwestern tip of my satrapy across the Hellespont with the stated intent of liberating the Greeks of Ionia and abroad from Persian control. I and two other local satraps have been given the task by Darius III to deal with the invasion ourselves. The historic battle that followed is now known as the Battle of the Granicus, I have been told by a local prophetess, and it is my destiny now, with the aid of Ahura Mazda and other local deities, to now change the supposed grave results of this fated lost battle. Backdrop to the Battle of the Granicus. The Battle of the Granicus was a battle fought between Alexander the Great of Persia and three Persian satraps habituated, habituated in the Western Asia Minor region in the spring of 334 BC. Although not the largest of battles in Alexander's roughly six year long campaign into the Achaemenid Empire, it was the first and this gave the battle some interesting themes. The first thing notable about the battle is that, as mentioned prior, it was not fought by any federal forces from the heartlands of Persia, but rather their regional governing nobles known as satraps. It was also one of only a few battles in the open where Alexander had the numerical advantage over the Persians, with the Persians having an estimated force of 20,000 cavalry and slightly less than 20,000 infantry and Alexander having roughly under his command an average out estimation of 35,000 infantry and only 5,000 cavalry. This makes both forces having roughly 40,000 men each with differing, with differing ratios of cavalry to infantry. Although the Persians themselves generally accepted that the Macedonians and their Greek allies had the superior infantry of the two. It bears mentioning that these estimations differ depending on source, with the Persians by some estimates on the contrary having less cavalry and significantly more infantry, being estimated at 30,000 in number. Either way, it is still universally accepted that Alexander possessed a greater force, with far less cavalry but more infantry to make up for. As is customary to many ancient sources, neither side's light infantry are noted in many sources either, except in passing when describing an event. These numbers matter as they dictate the power dynamic of Alexander and the three satraps he is pitted against in his former battle against the Achaemenid Persian Empire. But they do not matter merely, as with most of Alexander's later battles, where they impact the chances of winning a given battle only, but this also impacts how Alexander must treat his force if he is to have a successful campaign in Persia at large. It was known on both sides the financial strain that Alexander must have been dealing with as an invading force, in such a distant campaign from an upstart and now tax-free kingdom, and this meant that Alexander needed money, and soon. This means that as a smaller, but more financially stable force, the Persians would benefit from well-planned and well-thought-out strategies that benefited timing, while Alexander would have needed any sort of victory and as soon as possible, regardless of where or how. The strategy advantage was thus on the clock. Historically, the battle was lost on account of the Persians, who decided to meet Alexander's army head-on in battle, taking a defensive position behind the Granicus River and its muddy beaches, deciding against the Achaemenid loyalist and Greek general Memnon's idea to outweigh the Macedonians in a battle of attrition using scorched earth tactics. So what is my strategy of defending Western Anatolia from Alexander? It first must be noted the differentiation between strategy and tactics here, strategy encompassing a more broad, general, overall goal, while tactics involving more short-term goals, such as in a battle or even a specific maneuver within a battle. This thus highlights my strategy. One issue I see among the Persians here is a sort of shared arrogant optimism in the leadership at large. This is seen with Darius when he dismisses Alexander as but a mere small threat, and tasks only three of his local satraps to deal with him and also with the satraps, such as our own Aristides, here, where they refuse the advice of Memnon to seek a long-term, attrition-focused campaign in favor of an idealistic pledge to never let any Persian soil be damaged in the war to come. But as brought up earlier, this would have seemed to have been the safest and most practical bet to take strategically, for time was on the side of the Persians. The Persians had no need of risky moves to put on a positive show to the locals, for the Ionian Greeks already were firmly on the Persian side in terms of loyalty. It is thus the burden of Alexander 
to put on the charismatic and showy propaganda tales in his actions, and also his burden to find a quick victory. I see many parallels with the faults of the Persian leadership of this era, as I do with the Germans in the later years of World War II, with this baseless optimism and trust in victory as a given. I can understand more broadly why the Persians viewed this war as not a major threat, considering the size differences of the two nations, but certainly harm reduction should still be sought here, and any strong victory gained, even if merely a financial one, could have helped the Persians even make a push into Europe once more if sought, or at least gain tribute from Macedonians. Getting back to the topic of the invasion, in the broader strategy of the early in Anatolian campaign, I would have tried doing two basic things with the knowledge I would have had of my and Alexander's forces. In knowing we have a numerical disadvantage, as the Persians, but a time and financial advantage, I would have sought to prevent a fixed battle for as long as possible. Upon hearing of the city of Lampsacus not falling to the Macedonians, and maybe even hearing rumors of its bribe to Alexander, I would have deduced that the Macedonians did not want a long siege, and that they wanted a quick victory instead. This is good news for my side to hear. Assuming I, as Aristides, would have had a dominating influence over the talks of strategy with the other presiding satraps and generals, I would have made use of Persia's famously reliable and efficient royal roads to send out envoys seeking volunteers, recruitable slaves, and more mercenaries to bolster my ranks during the meantime, while I make sure my own forces stay away from Alexander. The extent to which I would have sought more out depends entirely on the unknowable treasury I would have had in my hands, but if desperate I would have taken a loan or sold some personal luxuries. But I don't think this would have been necessary, as I myself wishing to play it safe and knowing my side had a comfortable advantage in all except infantry numbers and quality, I would have only sought infantry recruits who are cheaper in order to equalize the one advantage Alexander would have against his, my own forces, his infantry count thus eliminating the only point of exploitation he could effectively use against my own forces. I might have considered Memnos' argument in favor of scorched earth tactics, but based purely on empirical notes of how the Macedonian forces were acting by use of scouts, I might have considered not even doing this, as it seemed Alexander sought more a quick victory than he did to set up camp and wait, which would then favor Scorch Earth tactics, on the contrary, as camps would have involved a higher need of sustaining themselves on local produce via raids and gathering. Thus my decision on Scorch Earth tactics would be based not upon heroic ideals, but rather on pragmatic responses to Alexander's approach. By the sides, Scorch Earth tactics would have only made it more obvious to Alexander that my forces were near, meaning he would send out his scouts to find me, something which I would want to avoid as much as possible. If I were to do Scorch Earth tactics, however, I would do so by attempting to mimic how Macedonian forces appeared in color code, and thus make the local Greek populaces only less likely of siding with the Macedonians, as they would then perceive my own pillagers as the Macedonians, and this would reinforce their view of Persia as a stabilizing force. This is all idealistic, of course. My course of actions entails an assumption that the Macedonians never get hints by locals of my own army's locations or find out by way of good and ambitious scouts. I also assume I could hopefully procure even just a minimal amount more of infantry to meet the Macedonian advantage, and also that the other generals all agree to my plans as well. None of these considerations might have happened, and cannot be guaranteed, but as with all plans, I need to make some assumptions and faith-based actions in the bid for a greater advantage. But this I find to be the best part of my strategy at large. In being so focused on safe bets and minimizing risk, I need not any of these scenarios pan out to my liking. In merely attempting them, my chances go up already in winning the campaign at large. It is unlikely, for instance, that if the other two satraps did want to fight head-on, that they would do so by separating from my own force. Even if they did, that would have made Alexander reap less potential loot from a successful battle anyways. So even if I did not have a dominating force over the other generals, they would still have to at least listen to me somewhat if I wanted to stay somewhere in risk of separating. So, now that I've discussed the strategy of my campaign, I must discuss the potential tactics I would use in a battle itself, such as in the Battle of the Granicus, if that ever happened, which I am attempting to avoid. So, the tactics of the battle itself. As I brought up the potential failures of my strategic plan, I also thus need to create a realistic tactic in beating Alexander in a head-on fight. While true that even if found in the prior scenario by Alexander, it is very likely my own force could outmarch him due to knowing the terrain better, 
having better local supply, having more horses, among other factors. I would still need to have some notion of a battle tactic, just in case he did somehow meet us under unlikely circumstances. In ancient, and even simply pre-modern warfare, one of the biggest decisions of a battle was in choosing the battlefield. In this, I find the historic choice of the Persian satraps to have been more than ideal, situated not only behind the Granicus River, but also having a hill behind them as well. Because I must assume I did not get my wanted reinforcements in my broader strategy, highlighted previously, and assuming I knew somehow that a battle was imminent, I would have likely done a similar course of action here as the historic Persian satraps had, and likewise stayed near a river such as the Granicus, or even the modern Jadiz River for instance, and preferably near a hill as well. You can't get any better than that as the defending side in terms of position. This is all to say, as part of my previous broader strategy of avoiding the Macedonians, I would have likely stayed near rivers just in case they ever did meet up with me. Thus assuming that this battle I would be having would be the same as the historic Granicus battle in location and troop count, I would take the following steps. Upon seeing Alexander extending his lines out to avoid flanking, or potentially flank me, and cross the river unopposed, I would have stretched out as well, seeing as our forces were nearly even, but with his army having more men, some might think it would be impossible for me to outdo his stretching. But his army consisted of more infantry, and specifically tightly packed infantry in both traditional Greek hoplite fashions, as well as the new Macedonian phalanx formations. My army would have had far more cavalry, and so I still think I could manage to outdo Alexander in this pre-battle competition of outflanking and stretching one another. This would mean I would essentially need to not overlap too many of my divisions, something the historic Persians did not do on the battle, instead favoring layering their cavalry in front of an infantry line, something I would avoid. I would, however, put some troops near to the riverbed with the intent of making a crossing harder. Specifically, I would have placed two Greek mercenary divisions on a right and left side of the focal point of the battle, allowing a gap in the center for the Macedonians to cross if they so chose to do so. Behind them would be some supporting lighter infantry and Persian spearmen. This ensures they would have had some backup in the event of being flanked by crossing Macedonian cavalry on the part of the behind lighter infantry. And the Greek forces present there would have had the intent purpose of allowing, but making challenging, a Macedonian crossing. I must assume that at this point I, as a Persian, would not have known Alexander's tactical styles in battle, but I would have been fine with this position regardless of if he defensively simply postured on the other side and waited, or if he did make a hasty crossing. After all, my broader sta strategies highlighted before benefit from further waiting. I also would have stationed the rest of my forces on the hill behind, with the formation essentially alternating back and forth between infantry and cavalry, allowing flexibility and, flav and favoring mixed infantry-cavalry engagements. This makes my own flanking easier, if ever sought, and also allows easy disruption of any strongly packed Macedonian formation if those ever got across the river successfully. My attention here is to maximize the chances of this never happening. If the below infantry divisions were in the threat of flanking, I would have had the time to charge some cavalry down the hill while the enemy crossed the river. It must be assumed here that just as in real life, Alexander would cross with his own cavalry, then being followed by some of his other forces. This is the ideal scenario for me, as I would have let them cross at least three-fourths of the way, intending for my Greek mercenaries to turn sideways and attack the flanks of whomever charges over. This would not have contained the much larger crossing forces, but this too is intended. As more forces make it across, I would have eventually sought a general charge down the hill by both my cavalry and lighter infantry to hit head on the crossing forces now sandwiched between my other Greek forces below. Some remaining Greek infantry would also run down the hill and set up formations on the flanks of my other forces, intending to halt any possible flanks by some non-committing reserve forces whom crossed elsewhere by the Macedonians. And in the scenario of a gap developing in my main battle, they would also be there to fill such a gap. The intention here is not merely the flank, but also the fact that as my men charged downhill, Alexander's forces would not have been fully formed up yet, thanks to my annoying Greek mercenaries below. When the initial cross was done by Alexander's cavalry or infantry, this would seem a good strategy. Alexander's cavalry would now be stolen of their chances for a good charge, and his phalanxes would not have had the chance to form up properly in formation. Hopefully. 
While neither me nor the other satraps and generals would have known how brave and frankly risky Alexander was with his own life, it is likely that Alexander could have died in this engagement, just as he had in real life on multiple occasions in the battle. My conclusion. In my general orientation in dealing with the Macedonian invasion, I have favored slow, safe plays overall against the Macedonians, and a firm stance in favor of defensiveness. Therefore, I have emphasized very much the background strategies of the battle, such as the financial, social, and logistical concerns, more so than the battle itself, as I see these as more important for this unique first battle in its underlying concerns. While perhaps it was intended to more focus on the tactics of the battle itself for the purpose of this assignment, I stay firm in my affirmations that maintaining a slow war of attrition and waiting would have been far more beneficial than having any battle at all. But for the purpose of the assignment, I included a battle tactical approach as well that I would have done if given control of the battlefield as the satrap Aristides, who may very well have been forced to fight the battle, as it happened historically, due to pressures from other satraps, among other political forces at play. I cannot of course guarantee that any of my ideas would have won the Persian side of victory, but I can say that my strategies and tactics make use of using the weaknesses of the Macedonians on multiple occasions, all the while trying to take from the Macedonians their own advantages over us as the Persians. This is the core of strategy and tactics at large, and thus I can say with certainty that my ideas are at the least norm in any general or commander's mind.